from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Peggy Perlstein, head of the Hebraic section in the African and Middle Eastern Division of the Library. Welcome to today's program, co-sponsored by the Center for the Book and the Publishing Office. We have a very full program, so I want to begin right away. I just would like to let everyone know that the former head of the Hebraic section, Dr. Michael Grunberger, is here, and so big welcome to him. <laughs> So I would like to introduce Dr. John Cole, director of the Center for the Book. Well, good afternoon, and let me join Peggy uh, and the Hebraic section and the publishing division uh, in welcoming you to the Library of Congress for a very special program. Uh, the Center for the Books, Books and Beyond series I counted them up today. This is our 244th talk. They started in 1996. These are special talks that have some, have books with authors who have books that have a connection with the Library of Congress, either through their collections or through their special projects. And we're very proud that uh, this series also uh, has been filmed. Nearly all of them are available on the webcast on the library's website. And we're pleased that today, of course, uh, for very special reasons, I don't have to have any explanation about the special connection with the Library of Congress. This is a Library of Congress program, and the product is a beautiful book, which you will have a chance to buy and have signed uh, at the end of the program. As I said, all of our programs are uh, videotaped for webcast. Uh, the format will be a presentation of, of our two guest authors and it's followed by a question and answer period. And we hope that you do have questions, but I do need to tell you that uh, if you ask questions, you will become part of our program. You're giving us permission to be part of the website, uh, for which I thank you in advance. Uh, it's my, also, uh, these are, programs are all part of the Facebook Books and Beyond Book Club. So there is information about the program and the speakers, both past and present in the Books and Beyond series. We're especially lucky today to have the Librarian of Congress to give us some background about the book, the library's collections. Dr. James Billington has been librarian since 1987. Uh, he is a wonderful advocate for our institution, and I especially like it when he is excited about particular parts of the Library of Congress's collections. And he is today, and we're very pleased that he can get us started. Then Peggy will introduce our speakers, and we will be on our way with our 244th Books and Beyond. Thanks for joining us. Peggy. Dr. Billington is going Right. Yeah, okay. Right. So I would just like to ask Dr. Billington to come up and make some remarks. Well, it's a great pleasure. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be uh, involved in uh, events, uh, the, the kind that uh, John Cole has been describing, which he so admirably led over a long period of time. And I think it's a particular pleasure when you're not talking about books in general, but you're talking about a special book uh, produced by the people of the book. Uh, because certainly in the Jewish tradition, they've, somebody once said to me, I can't remember whether it was Michael or somebody else said, but you know, these are our cathedrals, really. Uh, this is, uh, and this is a very special, special book indeed. Uh, indeed, I, I might just mention that uh, when I first came here as librarian, um, this uh, book, uh, this exhibit was already on the books. and. Uh, Rabbi Karp, Abe Karp from Rochester, was here, two-year residency, putting this exhibit together. And one of my most enjoyable introductions 
to the richness of the Library of Congress was Abe coming in, as he frequently did, and said, guess what I've just found in the music division? <laughs> and you don't have to look far to see how, how much of American music, of which, of course, we have the kind of mint collection, really is a product of, of the American Jewish tradition and, uh, and uh, the remarkable series of composers. And then he would come in and say, hey, in the scientific section, we just discovered so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. so it was, uh, I think the title was From the Ends of the Earth, as I remember, but it was from every end of the Library of Congress, too. So, uh, and it's a special, I was thinking about, about this particular book, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute, but um, just a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, um, former Secretary of State George Shultz here. And uh, some of you followed, I was uh, to some extent, in, at least in the, in the uh, involved in some of the cultural aspects of the, uh, of the end of the Cold War. And uh, one of the um, things that George Shultz is after his 90th birthday, he was, he was uh, talking here uh, with, actually, with former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry and, and former Senator Sam Nunn, <clears throat> and they were talking really about some of the nuclear questions and so forth. But uh, over dinner, George was reminiscing, and uh, he was reminiscing about his attending a Seder when he was in Moscow. And, uh, uh, you know, he's a very, he's actually a very modest guy, quite a wonderful representative for us on the diplomatic thing. But he said, you know, that was, uh, for him, a very, a very meaningful event. And, of course, the connections with the book that we're celebrating today are, are of course, obvious. Uh, anyhow, um, the, as you know, the, I'll get the light on here, uh, <clears throat> to w the special event we're celebrating today is the publication by Harvard University Press in association with the Library of Congress of a new facsimile edition of the Washington Haganah. It's fitting that we mark this occasion here in the nation's oldest federal cultural institution, which is also the home of this a precious illuminated Hebrew manuscript completed in 1478 by the scribe uh, Joel Ben Simeon. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Joel Ben Simeon will not be one of the <laughs> signers of the, bo of, of the books, but uh, faithful perpetuators of his tradition will be. Anyhow, the Hebraic section of the library and the collections in its care have, uh, I think, long been recognized as among the world's major resources for the study of Jewish civilization. Collection began, uh, well, really, uh, as an organized part of the library as a result of a gift in 1912 from the philanthropist J Jacob H. Schiff of nearly 10,000 items from the collection of bibliographer and bookseller Ephraim Dinard, the Washington Haggadah, arriving at the Library of Congress in 1916. Now, uh, this book, I need hardly, hardly tell this audience, is of benedictions, prayers, psalms, and commentaries recited every year at the Seder meal on the eve of the Passover holiday. Since the beginning of European printing, literally thousands of editions of the Haggadah have appeared, attesting to its remarkable hold on the minds and hearts of the Jewish people. In 1991, under the direction of Dr. Michael Grunberger, uh, former head of the Hebraic section, whom I wanted to second Peggy's welcome back. This is a, a wonderful bibliographer of this tradition and a, uh, a marvelous public servant. Um, anyhow, under his direction, the library celebrated the section's 75th anniversary through a major exhibition that I've already alluded to, that Rabbi Karp was, uh, was the major organizer of, but it was an exhibition of the finest examples of Hebraic and Judaica gathered from all the holdings in the library. Um, and with the collaboration of the Project Judaica Foundation, the library published a limited edition facsimile of the Washington Haggadah manuscript accompanied by a separate commentary volume. Now, almost a decade ago, the library made this unique treasure available to the public by digitizing the manuscript and mounting it online. And today we celebrate with Harvard University Press the publication of the facsimile edition of the Haggadah, meticulously reproduced from the library's original full-color digital scans. 
yet now put within the reach of everyone who would like to purchase it, to use at the Passover Seder meal, enjoy its rich illustrations and fresh commentaries by Professors David Stern and Ketrin Kogman Oppel. The facsimile of the Washington Haggadah vividly illustrates how the rituals of an ancient faith were successfully coupled, if you like, with the cutting edge technology by using the library's digital scans of the manuscript available on our website directly to create a new book. It also demonstrates the intricate and complex way in which a cultural heritage is transmitted, strengthened, and preserved for generations to come. So I want to congratulate everyone that's involved and say um, that this particular Haggadah is, I think, a, one, of the really, um, one of the really treasured gems of the national collection of the United States, which is what we basically have here, and a collaboration between the oldest federal cultural institution, the Library of Congress, and our oldest university and its press. So this is a signal event um, occurring uh, sort of at the appropriate time, but uh, it's something that we, we are happy to un unify this ancient tradition with this digital technology in which we at the library have been long involved and to celebrate this publication at this, at this time and in this place. We feel very honored to be part of it and we welcome you all here for what will be a, a festive occasion worthy of the holiday which is celebrated at the same time. So thank you all for being here and congratulations to, to the people who've made this possible. Uh, to John Cole and his, his enormously energetic continuing program over many years. To the collaborators and particularly our distinguished guests uh, who've been involved in this volume, and above all, to of course, to the tradition that is being represented and celebrated here, in which we're honored to play a small role. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Billington. Um, I think I can tell the audience that the Washington Haggadah is one of Dr. Billington's favorite treasures here at the library. Dr. Sharmila Sen is executive editor at large at Harvard University Press. She first approached Ralph Eubanks, head of the publishing office, about two years ago to propose this project, and we met soon after. A new facsimile edition of the Washington Haggadah clearly falls within her areas of interest at Harvard, especially those of world religions that appeal to a general intellectual audience as well as to scholars. Dr. Sen. Thank you, Peggy. I'll just take a few minutes to say, actually, I came to talk to Ralph Eubanks about a, a different book idea, but one that involved the collection of books that the library received through the Ephraim Dinard collection. And in fact, Ralph started telling me about this, and like all uh, good book projects that I can say as an editor and a publisher, it was absolute serendipity. And I think in my mind, it really crystallized when Ralph brought me over to your of office, Peggy, and you had the book out and you let me put on those white gloves and touch the book and I absolutely fell in love with it, having never been to a Passover Seder. So it also became a way for me to get lots of invites to dinners, as our <laughs> authors knew. So I went around for two years telling everybody that we're doing this book. And hey, by the way, I've never been to a Passover Seder, <laughs> which is, <laughs> uh, you know, it's hard publishing books these days. So I do what I can to try and get some dinner invitations. And I said, but if you invite me, I know what book I will bring. I know what gift I will bring. So literally from North America to Europe to Asia, I have standing invitations for Passover dinners, I think, from now till, you know, <laughs> for the rest of my life. Um, all I want to say is that when I saw that book that Peggy showed me and started telling me the story, um, it was an absolute emotional reaction 
we, our acquisitions editors, are meant to think much more in business-like ways these days. But I have to say that it was simply this idea that I fell in love with the book that was written and made for a table. And as David Stern's essay tells us, that in fact it's the table that precedes the book in this particular case. Without the Seder, without the, the dinner, there would be no Haggadah which would accompany it. And so I simply wanted to find a way to bring this book back to the table, to all our tables, and this just became a wonderful project. And as I got to see this develop, and hopefully you can take a look at it, I realized that you know this is a book. Books, book reading is supposed, sometimes supposed to be solitary. But this is a book which is actually the opposite of traditional solitary book reading. It's a book that's supposed to bring together communities of people and create continuity across time and space. And the making of the book in its own way created its own unexpected communities, I think. Communities that maybe Yoel would have anticipated and maybe once he would never have anticipated, but I think would be very proud of. Nonetheless, it led me to meet David Stern and Katrine Kogman Appel, you know, from Philadelphia, which is pretty close to Cambridge, but also from Beersheba, which is a little far mm -hmm. from, <laughs> and uh, Peggy and Ralph and, um, and lots of other people who are kind of visible and invisible presences around this new incarnation of the book. So I um, invite you to take a look at it and again, it is a real honor for Harvard University Press to work with the Library of Congress in helping bring one of your treasures to a wider audience. And I just hope it's the first of many collaborations. Thank you. Thank you, Sharmila. I'll have to invite you to my Seder as well. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Professors David Stern and Katrin Kogman Appel. Dr. David Stern is the Moritz and Josephine Berg Professor of Classical Hebrew Literature at the University of Pennsylvania. Educated at Columbia College, he received his doctorate from Harvard University. His fields of specialization are classical Jewish literature and religion and the history of the book. He's written widely on Midrash the Biblical Commentaries of the Rabbis, and authored eight books. He's currently working on a book which traces the history of the physical forms of the Talmud, the Rabbinic Bible, the prayer book, and the Passover Haggadah, and the ways in which those forms have shaped the meaning and significance of these classic Jewish books. Dr. Stern has received awards and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the American Council of Learned Societies. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Katrine Kogman Appel, who's Associate Professor of the Arts at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. She received her PhD from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Her areas of research include medieval art, Hebrew illuminated manuscripts, and imagery of the Hebrew Bible. Among the books she has authored is Jewish Book Art Between Islam and Christianity, The Decoration of Hebrew Bibles in Medieval Spain, and also Illuminated Haggadot from Medieval Spain, Biblical Imagery, and the Passover Holiday, which in 2009 was selected as the best book on Spanish history before 1516 by the American Historical Association. David and then Katrin. Thank you very much, Peggy. Um, I'd like to begin by saying how honored I am as a scholar and as an American Jew to have translated the Washington Haggadah's text for this new edition and to have written my introductory essay. I especially want to thank Harvard University Press and our magnificent editor, the choreographer, um, orchestrator of this entire project, Dr. Sharmila Sen, for inviting me first to participate in this wonderful project. And again, I want to thank uh, the Library of Congress, and in particular, Peggy Perlstein and the other staff of the Hebraic section 
for all their assistance while I was researching and writing my introductory essay. The Washington Haggadah is, I think, without question, the most important Haggadah in America. It's important for many reasons, on account of its place in the history of the Passover Haggadah as a book over, as a book over seven centuries, because of its many singular textual features, for the pieces of historical information about the observance of Passover and the Seder that are found in its pages, and as one of the most special works of Joel Ben Simeon, the 15th century scribe and illustrator who created the Washington Haggadah and himself was one of the greatest scribes and illustrators in the history of the Jewish book. The Washington Haggadah may not be Joel's most spectacular production, but it is his sweetest. Its modest quarto size, its understated elegance, and its uh, enchanting charm endow it with a fascination that few other Hebrew manuscripts have. There's some, something both truly beautiful and very approachable about this book. It possesses a kind of generosity of heart, a democratic spirit, and this especially comes out in the pictures, and I'm sure Katrine will speak about this, that makes it feel especially appropriate for this place, an especially fitting book to be owned by the Library of Congress of the United States of America. In my introduction to the facsimile edition, I try to reconstruct the life of this book from the time of its production until today. The full story of the Washington Haggadah's history is too long and complicated to recount in this present talk. But what I would like to do is tell you that part of the story that I think is most relevant to us present here today, namely how the Washington Haggadah reached these shores and this collection in our nation's capital. Essentially, the acquisition of the Haggadah by the Library of Congress was the result of the intersecting visions of two extremely different men, in fact, one can't imagine two men more different, within these walls and in this book. But before I get to these two figures and their stories, let me just sum up quickly the early history of the Haggadah after Joel first produced it in the year 1478. As scholars have surmised from the absence of a name of a patron or commissioner in the Haggadah's colophon, Joel probably first wrote the Haggadah for stock without a specific customer in mind, an unusual but not unprecedented practice that looks forward to the way books would be regularly produced shortly later in the age of print. We have no idea who first bought the Haggadah, though from several pieces of evidence, it seems almost certain that the first owner was a German Jew, which isn't surprising since Joel wrote the book in Germany, and that the, the Haggadah remained in Germany until the 18th century when it was taken to Italy, when it was taken to Italy. In the late 19th century, the Haggadah was owned by the Provençali family in Mantua, a very distinguished family with a lineage that went back to Moses Provençal, one of the most distinguished Talmudists of the Renaissance period, and his brother David, a very interesting figure who attempted to establish a Jewish university in Mantua. On folio 37, there's a remarkable note written by one A. Tori Finzi in German, dated April 7, 1879, which was indeed Passover Eve of that year, where he writes that they, he, and the other members of the Provençali family are sitting at the Seder table where they've just be sung the first part of the Gada, that's how he calls the Haggadah, and are awaiting the food. After it arrives, they start eating, he says, and A. Tori signs off, Guten Appetit. <laughs> Stains that probably stem from wine drops on several folios also confirm the fact that this Haggadah was actually used at Passover seders. All this changed, however, in the early 20th century. While we do not know the exact facts for certain, on June 10th, 1902, a certain book dealer who happened to be in Mantua at the time wrote to Judge Mayor Salzberger, one of the great communal leaders, Jewish communal leaders of the time and also a great Jewish book collector, lived in Philadelphia. Uh, this bookseller wrote to Salzberger that he was sending him eight rare books and manuscripts that he had bought in Italy, including an illustrated Haggadah written in 1478. And this was undoubtedly the Washington Haggadah. And for the latter, he wrote, the asking price was $500. In 
In a second letter written in August, however, the dealer conceded that his original asking price may have been too high and hinted that he was willing to bargain, but apparently Salzberger was still not interested enough to purchase the Haggadah, and it remained in the book dealer's stock for another 14 years. This book dealer was a Russian-born Jew named Ephraim Dinard. Dinard was one of the most exceptional figures in the history of the Jewish book in the last two centuries. A bookseller and bibliographer, a publisher, and the author or editor of, um, of some 50 books of his own, a Zionist activist and publicist, a major crank, and a vitriolic polemicist against a myriad of persons and causes not to his personal liking. These included Hasidism, Kabbalah, Reform Judaism, Communism, even the great rabbinic scholar and later chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, Solomon Schechter, Steinhardt was a seminal and still insufficiently recognized figure in laying the foundations for Jewish scholarship in America. Born in the Baltic region of the Tsarist Empire in the mid-19th century, he grew up in Lithuania, then moved to White Russia, and then went to Crimea, where he became the amuensis and factotum of the Karaite Abraham Ferkovich, who was probably the greatest book dealer in Judaica and Hebraica in all of modernity. Uh, as you can tell from this picture, Ferkovich was also quite a spiffy dresser. He liked to play the role of a Karaite held elder to the hilt. And he was a total, total scoundrel. In his very first book, uh, Dinard wrote a biography of Ferkovich, and he described how the dealer pressured his poverty-stricken fellow Karaites and stole and finagled valuable books out of them, in addition to forging manuscripts and artifacts in order to prove the antiquity of Karaite traditions in, of Karaite settlement in Crimea. Ferkovich also appears to have been a very good teacher and to have taught Dinard quite a lot about his trade. Over the time, here's Dinard again. This is the only picture of Dinard that I've been able to find. I mean, uh, he was such an exhibitionist, but he doesn't seem to have left uh, very many pictures behind. Um, uh, in any case, Ferkovich taught Dinard an enormous amount, and over time, Dinard grew into an extremely shrewd book dealer who was also, like his former teacher, deeply mistrusted even by some of his most loyal customers. His indefatig indefatigability in obtaining rare items became legendary early on, as did the questionability of the methods that he used to acquire those items. As Alexander Marx, the librarian of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America and the greatest expert on Jewish books during his lifetime, wrote about Dinard, how he managed to obtain some of these unique, unique volumes I do not know, but undoubtedly a considerable number would have perished in the disorders of the last decades if Dinard had not found them a safe resting place in great Jewish and general libraries. In October 19, 1888, with his wife, four young daughters, and niece, and 11 pieces of luggage, all of them stuffed with manuscripts and books, Dinard arrived in the United States, where he lived for the next 40 years, except for a brief aborted attempt to settle in Palestine, and many trips abroad in search of books and artifacts. During these 40 years, Dinard lived in Newark, New Jersey, St. Louis, and for the last set 12 years of his life, New Orleans. In all these places, he published newspapers, including one of the first Hebrew newspapers in America, many journals, and even more books. Following a time-honored tradition in Hebrew publishing of using fictional places of imprint, Dinard also issued books in places that he called Baltunavka, translates the Yiddish word for Chattertown, and the biblical site of Sodom. These books were both actually printed in Newark. And he dated books as having been printed, quote, in the printing press of Raziel the Angel 50 years before the creation of the world. That's, that's a very old book. <laughs> Dinard's lasting contribution, however, was as an agent in laying the foundations of some of America's greatest public and institutional collections of Hebraica and Judaica. Early on, probably even before he emigrated to America, Dinard recognized that America was likely to become a center for the modern critical Jewish scholarship that was then developing in Western Europe, known then as Wissenschaft des Judentums and today as Jewish Studies, and that there would be a need for great Jewish research libraries in the New World to support that scholarship. 
His main goal, he wrote, was to establish, here I'm quoting, libraries in all the leading cities of our land. It is my hope that in the course of time, I shall succeed in decimating Jewish literature in this barren country. If a Jewish scholar needs an ancient text now, he must go to Europe, to the British Museum, or the Body in, in Oxford. To remedy that situation, Dinard began by persuading professors like Richard Gottheil of Columbia University to establish Hebraica collections in their university libraries, and private collectors like Judge Salzberger to build collections which they would eventually donate to public institutions. He also sold an extremely important collection of Judaica objects to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC, whose librarian at that time was Cyrus Adler, later to become the president of Dropsy College in Philadelphia, the first non-sectarian institution of higher learning in ancient Near Eastern and Jewish studies in America. His final sale was that of his own private collection, 12,000 printed volumes, including 16 incunables and 29 manuscripts, which he sold to Harvard University just months before his death in 1930, thereby establishing the foundation for Widener Library's magnificent collection. Dinard's greatest dream, however, was to establish a major Judaica collection in America's national library, the Library of Congress, that would rival the collections in the great national libraries of Europe, like the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, the British Library in London, and the National Library in Berlin. It was a happy coincidence that precisely at this time, the Library of Congress itself was in the process of becoming a major research library that sought to cover all of world literature and culture. As I don't need to tell uh, you people here, the Library of Congress was originally founded as a library for Congress in order to serve the needs of its members. In 1814, however, the original library was destroyed in a fire set by British troops, and Congress decided to reconstitute it by purchasing the private library of Thomas Jefferson, America's third president and first bibliophile, whose 6,487 volumes covered the truly encyclopedic range of Jefferson's eclectic, humanistic, and scientific interests. Among its many treasures, Jefferson's library also contained seven books of Judaic or Hebraic interest, including the 1737 first edition of William Whiston's translation of the genuine works of Flavius Josephus, the Jewish historian, as well as a copy of De Legibus Hebraeorum, Baba Kama, Mimasechet Nezikin, with the Hebrew text and the Latin translation and commentary by the great 17th century Christian Hebraist, Le Constantin Lempereur of the University of Leiden. These few books, however, hardly constituted a serious Judaic collection, as Dinard well understood. And it was here that his vision intersected with that of the second person I mentioned earlier, Herbert Putnam, whose background in life could not have been more different from Dinard's. Putnam was born in New York City in 1861. His father was the founder of the Putnam Publishing House. Putnam attended private schools, received his BA from Harvard, and studied law at Columbia, but his heart was in librarianship, and between 1887 and 1899, he served as head of the Minneapolis Athenaeum, the Minneapolis Public Library, and the Boston Public Library before becoming librarian of the Library of Congress in 1899. During his 40-year tenure as librarian, Putnam transformed the Library of Congress into a major research library. He envisioned the library as a model and example of scholarly research in America, as well as a national institutional patron of the arts. With his broad cultural and creative perspective, Putnam also saw the library's mission as encompassing all of the world's cultures. And to that end, in 1904, he acquired a huge collection of classical Indian liter literature, and shortly later, equally impressive collections of Russian, Chinese, and Japanese literature. Now, Dinard witnessed all this, and he presently sensed that the time was now ripe to realize his own vision of establishing a major Hebraic collection in the Library of Congress. In 1909, he turned again to Putnam with an offer to sell him a collection of, I'm quoting, the oldest and rarest books which are to be found only in the British Museum, and some of them are not to be found even there. Putnam's response was slow in coming, but in 1912, he approached, with Silas Adler's assistance, Jacob Schiff, the German-born New York financier and Jewish philanthropist, 
um, to ask if he would be willing to purchase Dinard's collection as a, quote, gift to the nation that would serve, and again I'm quoting, as a recognition of the part which Hebrew history, literature, and tradition, as well as the Hebrew race, play and will play in the affairs of this country. After some persuasion, Schiff finally agreed, and the Library of Congress purchased Dinard's collection, which consisted of 10,000 books and pamphlets. This purchase came to be known as the first Dinard collection. In 1914, Schiff again bankrolled the purchase of a second collection of 4,200 volumes from Dinard, which he presented to the library as a second Dinard collection. And in 1916, the library purchased with its own funds a third collection of 2,300 items, and in 1919, a fourth collection of some 3,000 volumes. Altogether, Dinard sold the Library of Congress some 19,300 volumes and laid a strong foundation for its future growth into one of the world's great Hebraica and Judaica collections. The Washington Haggadah most likely arrived at the Library of Congress as part of the third Dinard collection in 1919. And here it remains today, one of the library's treasures, as we've been told, and a highlight of its by now truly extensive, even exhaustive, Judaic and Hebraic collection. Dinard's dream has been indeed realized. The Washington Haggadah, however, is no longer a functioning Haggadah, no longer a ritual text used at a Seder. It's a Hebrew illustrated manuscript of invaluable worth, available to scholars for research, a window into the world in which it was created, and its Jewish culture. But now, through this reissued facsimile edition, the Washington Haggadah is again an accessible book that can be read, studied, looked at, and even brought to the Seder table and used by any interested person. It's not even too, ex too expensive to spill a few drops of wine on its pages. And it is genuine proof that the Jews and the Jewish book have truly arrived in America. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm very thrilled to stand here. It rounds up a process that um, had been very full of pleasure for me. And ever since I got this first email from Dr. Sam asking me if I would be interested in collaborating in this project. And this collaboration had been wonderful um, for two or three years, I guess, both with Harvard University Press and the Library of Congress. I came to visit the library and uh, examine the manuscript. I received a great deal of help from Peggy Perlstein and Yasmin Khan. And actually, I can tell you that this has been grown into some obsession because I'm now really working on a, on a project that revisits and reconsiders the work of Job and Simeon. So I might uh, go on with this for quite some while now. So I shall. Uh, speak about uh, Joel um, as an illustrator, which we have not yet heard, because he actually did both in this Haggadah, uh, the text and the images. This is from another Haggadah. My heart counsels how to reply to him who asks and says, who painted these pages? I should answer him. I am he, Fibush, called Joel, for Jacob Mattathiah, may he live long, the son of somebody memheresh sein, a pious man. This colophon found in the so-called London Haggadah, copied by Meir Jaffe, a scribe from Ulm in circa 1460, for a patron, Jacob Mathathiah, from the same town. And like most medieval colophons, it defines my sleeve who has touched the keyboard. Um, unlike most medieval colophones, it defines Job and Simeon not as a scribe, but as an illustrator. Medieval artists or illustrators hardly ever did sign their work. And here we have thus a man with clearly defined professional identity. In fact, Job and Simeon must have been an all-rounder of late medieval and early modern book trade, Jewish book trade. As we have learned already, he must have been born around 1420 in Cologne and may have received training as a scribe in the Rhineland. 
I was hoping David would say that, but he didn't, so I'm telling you. So he, was, he, he grew up in the Rhineland. He reached Italy around the middle of the century, and there he seems to have received some artistic training as well, as from now on, his style is clearly Italianate. In fact, for all his career, he would use a drawing style that was quite common in Italian book illustration throughout the 15th century. While still in the Rhineland, he produced two manuscripts still extant. One is the so-called first Nuremberg Haggadah on the screen. His scribal style being quite professional, his drawings are a bit crude. They are, however, clearly embedded in a typical German tradition of illustration. For example, the so-called spared ground technique, for, um, which was very popular in German book illustration, uh, meaning that you see uh, parchment-colored figures on ink-colored background, uh, which has been uh, extremely popular. And here you have an example from a Christian manuscript from Nuremberg. Um, he uses abundant marginal illustration, which are also typical for, um, uh, for German book illustration, even though in this particular book they have all been cut out, so I can unfortunately not show any of them. But the practice of, un the practice of unframed marginal illustration was very common in Germany, and we shall soon see that they appear also in the Washington Haggadah. In 1452, at the latest, Joel can be traced uh, in Italy, signing a machzor first in Germona. He was now a young professional who, as many of his Ashkenazi co-religionists, had decided to try his luck further to the south, to cross the Alps, and to settle in Italy. For a young Jew who had grown up in the German lands, Facing the threat of persecution and expulsion, northern Italy seemed like the per perfect alternative. In contrast to Central Europe, where Jews were often expelled or suffered constant harassment, violent persecution and forced baptism, early modern Italian culture facilitated acculturation and cultural exchange. Only a few of Joel's Italian colophones mention places. And it is quite clear that he did not settle anywhere for long but rather continued to move, seeking work in various locations. Around the same time, he was involved also in the, in the making of at least four Passover Haggadot. And it is in these books that he would establish and develop a rich repertoire of Haggadah illustration that would prove to be the foundation of this genre for the generations to come. He returned at least twice to Germany around 1460 and 1478 when he wrote and illustrated the Washington Haggadah. The Washington Haggadah thus reflects Joel's work at the peak of his career. And what you see on the screen is one of the Italian, uh, the earlier Italian Haggadot. Um, by the time he signed it in 1478, he was a mature scribe and artist who had traveled between the cultures. In his migrations between the two regions, Joel was in a sense an agent of cultural exchange, importing elements of Ashkenazi illustration into Italy and taking back stylistic devices acquired in the region south of the Alps. Let us take a closer look at the imagery of the Washington Haggadah as a representative of Joel's Haggadah repertoire. Apart from illustrating the Haggadah text, Joel also took a fancy in various means of decoration. For example, the Washington Codex contains several painted initial panels, as the one you see on the screen, opening words for various text sections. They had been very popular ever since um, book illustration became um, um, started. They follow a recurring pattern of letters written in gold and floral designs on a blue background framed in gold. Joel also was an expert on pen flourishings, a bit of which you see here, uh, that often extend from the frames and these, panel, uh, and these panels to the outer margins. One of the books associated with him, a Marzor from Italy, in fact contains only such flourishings with various figural masks interwoven. The text on each page leaves ample margins for the drawings. Originally, these margins were still broader. They were trimmed during re later rebinding. In the corners, we can see, sometimes see that the color fades, as the book must have been extensively used. 
Let us take a very short look at these images. I don't follow them pa page by page. I'd rather present them here in uh, thematic groups. The series of marginal illustration begins with two images that depict the search for leaven and the burning of the final leftovers of leaven found in the house. On the left is a man shown scrutinizing a cupboard, while on the right a youth is using a pair of bellows to steer a fire. And Joel really had a, had a, a, a fancy for, for daily objects. To, he, he really looked very closely at, at society, at what's going on, so he uses all kinds of of realia, of objects, of, of um, things like the bellows. Several other images follow a similar approach. A man pouring wine illustrates the text, in what ways is this night different from all other nights? Two women and a man are busying themselves with the preparation of the meal as an illustration to the Dayenu prayer on folio 14 recto as a reminder that the time has come to get the meal ready. A monkey, somewhat grotesque, seated on a red cushion holds a matzah a few pages later. On the following page, an apparently unhappy couple represents the maror, the bitter herbs, and by extension, the bitter life in Egypt. A luxuriously dressed man raises a cup, illustrating the text, therefore, we are obligated to thank, acclaim, and, prize, and praise. As in all Haggadot, made by Job and Simeon, the questions of the four sons are illustrated by four figures, each representing a certain social type. The wise son is shown at the upper right, is shown as a seated scholar with an open book. The wicked son beneath him as a knight, a gentile as a matter of fact. The simple son is shown as a man in a somewhat worn out cloak seated on the floor and a fourth son, who doesn't know how to ask, appears as a jester. An elaborate composition illustrates the text, pour out your fury on the nations that do not know you. Joel left a particular large mar margin when writing the text at the base of this page to allow sufficient page for the image. It shows a castle-like structure on the left with a youth peeking through the door and inviting Elijah or the Messiah who, riding on a donkey, approaches from the right. He is accompanied by an entire family seated behind him on the donkey's rear. In several slightly later examples, including the Washington Haggadah, the figure on the donkey is accompanied by followers, some seated on the donkey behind the Messiah and others seizing the donkey's tail. And Joel has here developed a whole iconography. He started out in an early Haggadah with a short version of this image, and then throughout his career uh, developed more and more details. Now, to understand this image, we have to go to a 16th century text written by a baptized Jew uh, and reporting a Jewish folk belief about the coming of the Messiah. And he does so in a quite anti-Jewish uh, tone, but we can grasp still what is actually going on in this picture, and I'm quoting that text. According to the lies of the Jews, when the Messiah comes, he will ride upon an ass and seat all the Jews upon the ass, while all the Christians will sit on the ass's tail. And you see a, 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 a figure, a tiny figure of a woman grabbing, trying to grab the tail. Then the Messiah will ride with all his passengers into the sea, and when he comes to the depth of the sea, the donkey will drop his tail, and all the Christians will fall into the sea and drown. And indeed, this will have to be a very big ass. But an even bigger ass is a person who believes such things. So we have here the, <laughs> the anti-Jewish uh, account of uh, and we can be sure that in the Jewish version this sounded differently, but perhaps it was just known orally and not in a written source. One scholar suggested that the last person in the Washington Haggadah on the right, indeed, would be a Christian maidservant um, holding the tail. The last image in this series, um, uh, towards the end of the text, shows Daniel in the lion's den as an illustration to the poem, Then you performed many miracles at night or rather specifically the sentence in this poem, the one who was saved from the lion's den solves the frights of night. Since his early days in Germany, 
uh, in the German lands, Job and Simeon took a fancy in verbal puns, expressions from the text translated literally into the visual language. A typical example appears on this page near the text, I'm quoting the text of the Haggadah, go forth and learn what Laban the Aramean saw to, do our to, to our ancestor Jacob. The marginal illustration shows a man in traveling gear, a short mantle, a chaperon, a hood covering the head and neck, and rather high hat with a feather, leggings, and high boots. Over his shoulders, he carries a lens, a water container, and a bag. Emphasizing the act of going forth, he moved forward energetically on a small piece of green land. So this is not an, an, an illustration to the whole section, just to the first sentence, go forth and learn. And then somehow, I believe that Joel identified himself with this figure because he went a lot went out a lot and learned a lot, actually, on his travels. Um, on another folio, the text of the Hallel reads, in distress, in distress I called on God. The word distress, matzo, can also be understood as siege. And the verse would read, from the siege I called on God. Joel drew a walled town with a large tower in whose window the face of an imprisoned man David, the author of the psalm, can be discerned. Another theme that Joel depicted occasionally, and which, however, is not included in the Washington Haggadah, but I still would like to show it to you, is an elaborate composition of the thematic high point of the Haggadah, the crossing of the Red Sea. This example is taken from the London Haggadah, and it spreads the scene over a double page. On the right-hand page, a massed Egyptian army approaches. On the left folio, Moses follows the column of fire, leading the Israelites safely through the waters. What is interesting in this composition is not only its rich iconography, but also, and most importantly, the spatial representation of the two crowds of people reaching relatively deep into the picture space. Early Ashkenazi work had known nothing of the kind. Old Testament illustration had a long tradition in Italy, reaching back to the early Christian period, when the churches of Rome were decorated with elaborate narrative cycles of the history of the Israelites. And the crossing of the Red Sea figures prominently in this tradition. Let us take a short look at Cosimo Roselli's compositions of the Red Sea scenario in the Sistine Chapel from the late 15th century. It postdates Joel's work, but it gives us a sense of how a 15th century Italian artist would have approached the subject. Also in the details of his figure style, Joel never fully acquired early modern Italian perspective and three-dimensional articulation. The organization of the picture space, as in this image, is indebted to Italian art to a rather high degree. So and it shows very beautifully how Joel learns from this Italian tradition and how, it incorporate, how he incorporates this into his repertoire. To conclude, Joel was a man of versatile skills, active in an age of great movement in the book trade and moving between two cultures. Joel ben Simeon must have seen quite a great deal. He was perhaps twice expelled from German towns, first as a child when the Jews had to leave Cologne in 1424, and later perhaps also from Bonn, where his family had moved after the expulsion from Cologne. He was still a young man when he set out for Italy. Still, he must have had some sense of the tremendous changes in German economic life. An early 15th century native of the Rhineland, he belonged to a Jewish community which was persecuted in a region where the political and economic situation of the Jews had gradually deteriorated since the 12th century. When he emigrated to Italy, he certainly sensed a change of cultural atmosphere, got a taste of early modern humanism and changing artistic styles, and was able to witness dynamics of close Jewish-Christian relations to a degree that a German Jew would not have been able to witness. Joel began to build up his repertoire of Haggadah motifs early in his career while still in the German lands. 
Aware of the local tradition of Haggadah illustration, he developed a cycle of which, unfortunately, we have only a scant idea, as the margins of the two early books are so badly preserved. In his, on his arrival in Italy, he saw early modern Italian art, echoes of which can be found in his subsequent work. Later, he introduced some of these more recent motives in Haggadot he made while temporarily working in Germany. The Washington Haggadah, being one of his mature works, eloquently demonstrates this entire process. Thank you. I think we have time for one or two questions. Do you have any? Yes. Have these stains ever been examined to see what they were? Yes, yes, I think they were. And you can ask two of our conservators who are in the back um, afterwards. Um, but they have been examined over the past several decades. And I think they have been determined to be food, some kind of food stains. Mm -hmm. All right, before we conclude, um, I'd like to let you know that the Washington Haggadah will be on loan to the Metropolitan Museum of Art for three months beginning April 7th, and David and Katrine will be speaking there on April 7th. We began the program with the Haggadah open to the initial page, and now for something rarely seen by the public, our exhibit and conservator specialist will do a page turn right in front of your eyes, and the Haggadah will be open to the illustrations of the four sons in the Passover story. As soon as that's done, we invite you to purchase your books, and David and Katrine will be happy to sign them for you. It's already been done. Oh, OK. All right, so please enjoy the second page opening. Thank you for coming very much. <laughs>